Is everybody okay? Dry seats? Um, there's seats also here if anybody wants them on the sides, lots of seats. Uh, thank you all for being here and, and braving the rain. You guys are all really brave to be here with us. And I hope we can all huddle together and stay dry and enjoy a really good conversation about what I think is one of the most critical issues facing our industry in fashion. And that's how do fashion and ethics work together and can fashion and ethics work together? We hear the terms like giving back as the new luxury and it seems even more poignant in our region at this time with a growing refugee crisis. But can fashion really play a role for positive impact and positive change? And today we have with us two very inspiring women who can both say a resounding yes, fashion can make a difference and cash fashion can be a hero. I want to quickly uh, introduce, it won't be that quick because they're quite accomplished, um, my panelists here with me today, Sara Beydoun. Um, Sara probably doesn't need that much of an introduction, but I'm going to give a long one anyways because there's a lot of things I want to say about her. Sara is the founder and creative director of Sara's Bag. Her iconic line of handbags, which she launched in her hometown of Beirut in May 2000, are distinctly recognizable for their play, uh, playful and fun styles. She has a huge international reach with re retailers like Net-A-Porter, Shopbop, Matches.com, Liberty, Bon Marche, and many, many more. But she's a legend really more for what she's managed to accomplish alongside that commercial success. And that's building a brand that's grown exponentially while still being very much rooted in her original company's ethos, which is empowering underprivileged women. Her bags are handcrafted by women artisans in Lebanon many of which come from backgrounds that otherwise would not be employable. Sara is also the recipient of the 2016 Oslo Business for Peace Award. She's the first Lebanese woman and the first fashion industry recipient globally to get this illustrious award. It's given annually to individuals who exemplify the concept of, quote, business worthy. And what that means is applying one's energy ethically and responsibly for creating value for society. And Sara not only creates value for society, but she creates really beautiful pieces for us all to enjoy. So thank you, Sara, for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Um, equally illustrious, Katerina mm. Ocio. She has a very impressive background as well. She spent 15 years with the European Union and the UN, managing projects about employment strategy and gender issues in Turkey, Egypt, Morocco, Russia, Belarus, Armenia. In 2010, she was the EU policy advisor in Tunisia. And at that time, the idea for CIMI was born. In 2013, Katerina took a leap of faith and launched what is now the only fair trade verified brand in the Middle East. In just three years, she's considered a pioneer in ethical fashion. She works with artisans who live in, Tunisian, in a Tunisian women's shelter to make her heart-shaped Simi jewelry. Katerina has sold over 3,500 units since she started her company. She has distribution in Colette, Galleries Lafayette, uh, Joyce in Hong Kong, to name a few. And the brand's socially-minded message has caught the eye of many fashion luminaries. She's collaborated with Tommy Hilfiger, Karl Lagerfeld, and Missoni. Her Tunisian artisans created ethically sourced stars that Tommy Hilfiger showed last year on the runway. She's done micro crocheted capsule collections for Cara Lagerfeld and linings for Missoni dresses. She's also the first designer to be supported by Fashion for Development's Moda Care Foundation. So we have a lot to talk about and I'm gonna get straight into it. Yeah. Certainly well deserving a round of applause. I wanna start at the very beginning of how this all began for both of you. Um, you know, personal ethics are so important to all of us, but it's very hard to stick with it in the business world. And I'll start with you, Sara, because I know this kind of began as a project for you based on your master's work in sociology. Can you tell us a little bit of how it started and when it moved from being a project to actually being a brand? Uh, so I, um, I was raised in the war and uh, I, I saw, like, I saw the miseries and everything, but uh, once I started doing my thesis, I chose a specific subject, underprivileged women, and particularly prostitutes and women who've been through a lot of uh, abuse. So I went, uh, I, uh, I worked with an NGO and spent six months uh, uh, with these women. I heard their stories and what they've been through, and I just couldn't walk away from everything and said that I need to create something that would make them work and 
like create an, uh, build up a new skill that will help them reintegrate into society. And this is how it started. It started ju just as a project. I went to the prison, started with a few girls, and then it started to pick up. And I realized if I wanted to continue and uh, for it to be sustainable, I really have to turn it into a business. And that's how Sarah's bag was created. So you finished your master's in, in sociology yeah. and, and finished your thesis, and then you launched this as a, as a project. I launched as the project. No, I launched a project, and then for the project to be sustainable, I said it must be become a company, and uh, this is how it uh, became. And can you tell us a little bit about how your how you work with those women exactly? Mm. What what do they do with you, and what do they do for your your products? Actually, they execute all the handwork. So every uh, on the bags that uh, there is a lot of handwork and embroidery. The embroidery is executed by them. We give them the designs and the raw material, and we visit, visit the prison once a week. We give the work, and then the wor next week we come back to receive the work. And with time, uh, the girls that became really skilled continue working with us upon the, uh, when they finish their sentences. So we select the good ones, the ones that are worth continuing working with, like the ones that prove to be very professional. And they work from their villages once they're out of the pr prison, and they form small groups. Each group is responsible for a certain technique. And now we have around 200 women working with us. Wow. 50 of them are in the prison, and the rest are women who finish their sentences or, I got or are or they're guided by w uh, girls who finish their sentences. So uh, the, um, the lady responsible for the team is, uh, acts as a link between us and the girls. Okay, so m have some of these women been with you since the beginning in 2000? Yes. Uh, when they were in prison and then out yes, of Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like I have the first girls who started working with me now head big teams and are very well reintegrated in their community. And they, uh, they're, uh, they proved that this whole model works. Right, right. Katerina, you went from development to design, not a very traditional uh, career move. Can you tell us a little bit about what led you to creating See Me? Um, well, it's not just an instant uh, revelation that, that, that happened. It's more what uh, Steve Jobs calls connecting the dots. So I've worked many years in many countries uh, and that's so on, seen uh, women producing fantastic things with their hands, craftsmanship that was mostly used to produce objects not sellable on the market. So, and all of a sudden, um, I realized that there was the fair trade movement whose products were definitely not beautiful. I would enter a fair trade shop and it would, would, was difficult to find something that I would wear every day. Right. To be honest, it was a lumpy T-shirt, and uh, and then I would, but I was very much attracted by the aesthetics of the high-end, the luxury sector, and it struck me how nobody has thought to put them together up to now. It's like how come that nobody could think of upgrading the product of fair trade to a level where any glamorous woman would like to wear that product, mm -hmm. and luxury industry is one uh, of the less transparent of the fashion industry and, you know, what Barbara was saying also today, the fact that it's expensive, it does not mean that the people that made it were well paid. Yeah. So, you know? You, um, so you wanted to create a product where women in these communities where you're working in development were benefiting. Yeah. But it sounds like what you're saying is there was also this sort of stereotype around products that you buy from fair trade, yeah. which is that, oh, it's our charitable donation and we'll buy this one thing once a month and then it sits in some corner in your closet or yeah. in your drawer. Um, how do you create something, and, and it's a question for both of you really, that people actually want to wear and how much of this tag of ethical do you use in your marketing? Wh when does it benefit you and when does it not? Um, and I'll start with you, Katerina. Um I use my story very much very much, but not before the product. The quality of the product, the design of the product has to stand up. I started the heart because I was born in, in the Medina of Tunis. I was just working there in my breaks, and I was there. And it's a traditional handicraft from Tunisia. It's hammered technique, and all of you know these chains made of rings. So it's the same technique, just uh, I went from the circle to the heart. 
And uh, I was wearing the heart, and it was just very big. And just like happens today, people were stopping me in the street to say, oh, where is it? Where does it come from? Beautiful. Where did you buy it? I said, I don't know. I don't even have it. What? So the product has to come before. And the fact that people recognize and like the object is the most important part, yes, right? Definitely. It's the same thing for me. I always wanted people to love the product. And even now, when I go to trade shows and I'm selling my bags, uh, uh, retailers come in and put orders, but I uh, refrain myself from telling the story until they're done with their orders, and I, the story is always used to back up the product. Right. I don't want anybody to buy the product because like, they, they have right. pity or it's anything. It's, it's more like they love the product, they buy it, and the story is good, so they love it more. Right. No, I use it, I, I use it before, uh, to, to close the sale. To <laughs> close it, yeah. <laughs> But you also have sort of a very different um, uh, company in yeah. general and products that you're doing. Sara, you put out many, many style, styles, season after season. Um, so, you know, you produce many products. And it's, Katharina, yours is, is, is a bit more focused on one symbolic heart symbol that's reinterpreted in different pieces of jewelry. Yeah, and you have this naive idea that I want to replace violence with love. Yeah, Just oh, that's a great symbol. But... Um, I want to actually take a step back and talk about how we define fair trade or ethical or sustainable because this is kind of a confusing term in the mm -hmm. market. And what does it mean and what does it mean for your brands? And I'll start with you, Katharina, since for you, you're the first that's trademarked as, as uh, fair trade. And what does that mean and how did you go about that process? It was very difficult. Uh, fair trade certification for non-food product because most of you know fair trade from cacao, coffee, mm. well, what is it? Ju fruit juice, you have fruit juice. Yeah. Uh, many more things. Non-food certification is uh, more uh, complex because you certify the process as there are very few raw material you can acquire that are fair trade certified. In my case, when I use silver, it doesn't exist, fair trade certified system. So back to the fair trade, uh, the World Fair Trade Organization set out 10 principles. And that sort of put together all the different pi parts and bits of the sustainability that you can imagine. For many years, sustainability was green, eco-sustainable, no? so good for the environment is one of the 10. And uh, uh, no child labor is the second one. Capacity building for the people that are working for you. Uh, trade union mm -hmm. rights. Um, decent working uh, spaces. And these are all work. audited and, and... It was very difficult because being the first one in the region, they, they didn't know, they couldn't send anybody for the audit process, so it took me two years. Wow. And I hope I, I will not remain the only one for long, and I advocate for, for fair trade to come to the region because yesterday we were speaking about buyers uh, and what makes your product stand out, why should the buyer choose your product, I found that fair trade helps me very long, very much. Because, I mean, you, it, to manage Colette and Galleries Lafayette, and you know, you've spoken on in luxury summits with Susie Menkes, and in a very short time, was it that fair trade bit that kind of quickly um, elevated you in the it's eyes of it's buyers? It's, or? it's more a combination of, of things, you know. Unfortunately, and the 24th of April is the anniversary, Rana Plaza happened. Right? Which was in Bangladesh, uh, the Rana Plaza oh. crisis. And um, let's be honest, in Rana Plaza, there were not only H&M making jeans. There were many, some, not many, some high-end fashion that were also producing there. Right. But, you know, that's not sad. Right. So Rana Plaza happened, and all of a sudden, the world had a wake-up call. It's like, all right, behind everything you're wearing today, now here, there are hands, there are people, there are human beings, and it is very important, it's about time that what makes you feel good makes happy the person who made it. Because you don't need my jewelry, let's be honest. Why do you need a heart? You don't need a ring, you don't need a bracelet. But the fact that by buying a bracelet, you feel beautiful, first of all, and then you make an impact on the life of the person that made it, could make a difference in purchase. And that's why Susie Mackens invited me to speak about a new trend in consumer behavior right. 
and in the market. So for you, it differentiates you in consumers' in consumers' minds as well as buyers' minds. What about for you, Sarah? Because I know that you consider yourself more a socially responsible brand. What does that mean for Actually, you? Actually, it's, it's not uh, being a socially responsible brand is being a brand that's profitable, but at the same time you profit the society or a certain cause you want to support. And uh, my whole brand started out out of a need, and it, everything is built around the skills of these women I work with. Definitely, as she was saying, people buy the bag and want to buy the story behind it, and it's an added value. And I felt this from the start. Although, like, the story is, our story is told in every bag throughout a card that's in it, and the salesperson in my shop and uh, around the world say this, uh, tell the story also. It's very important. And the consumers now, they want to know, uh, all kinds of consumers now want to know what kind of products they are buying, who did them, and under which conditions they are done. So the consumers are not like they were 15 years ago. Now everybody is more educated, and a lot of people are uh, finding a lot of, uh, uh, like you, they're happy to buy a product that, that also supports a cause. Right. Um, supporting a cause can also sort of have some challenges, I imagine, when we're talking about production. I mean, production is something that all designers, whether you're socially responsible or not, ha are challenged with. Yeah. Meeting orders on time, uh, uh, getting, getting your production done on time for you, finding the right factories. How does that affect you um, as, as, a, as a socially responsible brand? And I'll start with you, Sara. Are all of your bags made by these women um, in these uh, cooperatives? Actually, uh, everything started with these women, but with time, when we started to expand, this is how we figured out a way to continue working with them once, once they're out of the prison. But also with the demand, we started to look around for different crafts we love and to develop different skills that have nothing to do with the girls we work with, but skills uh, uh, like that are special to the region, like the woodwork and the marquetry, and many other skills but that we always try to develop in order for us to be uh, commercial, uh, commercial and viably commercial. Right, right. Um, is there a way to break down which ones sell better? Like every season, it's different. We had seasons where the handwork would just uh, is the most demanded and other seasons where it would work, but they sort of complement each other. And when you get in, go into Sarah's bag shop, you either buy a bag that has been worked by the girls or you buy a, work, a bag that has been printed or hand worked or so on. They all fall back on each other. Yeah, I know there's one bag that a lot of us know, they're, they're very pop um, uh, Lebanese yeah. sort of sayings like wow are, are very popular. Were those ones done uh, by the women? I yes, think definitely. We have a photo this of is one there. yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, this is made. Uh, I had to look back into my old archives and look at what I have done t 12 years ago, and uh, this is where I brought back all the pop art. I had done it in a very naive way when I started, and then and now I did it like with the printing, proper printing, and uh, all the hand embroidery on canvases. Do you have a challenge delivering on time? Because I know that Wow Brag was was it picked up by Net Porte and yeah. it was in, in many major retail outlets. No, actually we started we start uh, because we get the order six months ahead, so we have time to prepare ourselves. It's always a challenge, but uh, so far we've been coping. So, yeah. How about for you, Katerina? What's your model, and how does production work for you? And have you always been able to ramp up when you needed to? Mm, the, the model that I, I'm, I'm developing is a bit different. Uh, it's called in technical terms, it's called social integrated management. So um, I created an atelier and I start with professionals that are in the industry and they train on the job girls that come from the shelter home run by the association Amal in, uh, in Tunis. But I don't own the atelier. You see, uh, the idea is, is to make them independent from me as well. And uh, I made sure they were certified as a producer and I am certified as a seller, as a distributor of their product. So if you go on my website, uh, you have the way to con a possibility to contact them directly and make your jewelry produced there. So you basically set up a, a workshop yeah. that anyone can use now. Anybody, as, as many as possible, please do. And um, what, what about price points? Is it more expensive? to have things done um, in, in these environments. I mean, that's always one of the things that people are so sensitive about is, is the price, the cost 
to produce this way? Is it more of a cost to you? Uh, it's more of a hassle, definitely, because it takes a lot of patience. And uh, when, you st when you work with these people, um, you have to be aware that they are going through a lot of tra trauma in their lives, being in prison, and after that, trying to reintegrate in the to the social life. So it's a lot of effort. However, the, um, in my case, for the everything that's handworked in Lebanon, uh, the labor is not cheap. We're not using cheap labor, and uh, all the girls are being very well paid. Some of them, um, some of them, like uh, have their full-time job is to work uh, with us uh, on handwork. So they are very well paid to continue working for years. Right, right. But it's a handmade product that wherever you produce a handmade product would no, be priced in some uh, in some uh, countries, it's less expensive to right. produce uh, everything that's hand beaded. Right. Well, then to be honest, uh, the, the the model that I call uh, fair luxury or fair trade luxury, or ethical luxury, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's based on it's based on a win-win situation, where the people have made the product are well paid. The company is having a normal profit margin, yeah. and the end consumer has a good happy. Mm -hmm. is happy. So it's a myth that fair trade has to be more expensive. It's not true. It's not. It's not. What are the price points? For instance, this cuff that I'm but wearing. But, and that's about. Sorry to yeah. stop you. The price that you. Uh, it's not more that you pay. It's more that in money, but in time. Mm. And she's very time. right. We don't only take care of the economic, uh, uh, financial independence of the women that work with us. We also take care of their social integration. Mm -hmm. So we have dedicated people that make sure that they can get back on their feet. And we run into pretty some tough emergency situation. So apart from the price that uh, I pay on the salary, we have also an, uh, uh, a social funds for emergency. Right. Because emergency can be... Right. It can be quite a lot of things. You work yeah. with women that are, are victims of domestic violence. Uh, victim of violence. Survivors. Okay. Let's call them survivors. survivors. Yeah. But getting back to my point, I'm curious, and I'm sure a lot of people are are the price points of your products. Yeah. Um, where do they fall, and are you competitive with others in your category? Actually, our price points are between uh, $150, and they range on to the very luxurious products we do uh, that uh, could reach $1,200. Okay. But like it's 5% uh, of our products right. only. Uh, actually, we, uh, we try to position ourselves as um, medium luxury, like medium high luxury. Right. Right. And uh, this is regardless of the cause and the story. Right. It's just the product That's itself. That's your commercial yeah. uh, uh, strategy. How about for you, Katerina? Um, I am lower in prices than brands at the same level, let's say. And it's been, a, I mean, and I like very much what Pascal was also saying yesterday, uh, studying the pricing policy and the pricing point and the positioning of the company is very important. Yeah. And you have to, under to understand, you have to go in places that stand where do you want to stand possibly in a department store, mm -hmm. that's a dream of everybody, yeah. and how much the other things cost and why should they buy yours. Yeah. Yeah. So the price, my price point is a bit lower than the rest, but so we sell, the sell through is very higher when it's put in, in, um, luxury. Yeah, in, in luxury. Yeah. And no. then... Actually, this is what happens with us. They place us uh, around the world in luxurious uh, department, in, in luxurious uh, shops. So we end up being the most affordable in luxury. Yeah. So, so you this have to is, be I think, about what category I think it's, it's a very good uh, entry uh, yeah. point. Yeah. See where, wh who, who would like, where would you like to be, and what, what are their prices, and yeah. try to be competitive in that. Yeah. Do something nicer and, 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 and better price. That's a really and good beautiful tip. boxes, by the yeah. way. That's very important. I mean, we all packaging. like boxes. Packaging is very yeah. important. <laughs> Did you have a point when, for both of you, when you realized you'd sort of made it? That okay, you know, this is this is a, this is a, my company is is gonna last. I can I can continue to to do this and support these women in these groups. Actually, I've uh, <laughs> I've had this quite a little bit. Like I've. I've seen my products in magazines, and this gave me a thrill. I've seen them on women wearing them, that women I admire, and like uh, influencers. And I've seen them in retail stores, but 
like what really, really makes me happy is, uh, for example, I have a girl that works with me and she's, um, she's been working with me for 14 years. I met her in the prison and uh, she was uh, a graduate from university. Uh, she was in prison because her, her boyfriend made her sign some papers. And uh, she stayed in prison for six months and this is where I met her. We started working together and uh, once she was out of the prison, she continued working with us. And uh, she forms, she, she's the one that's responsible for everything that has to do with calligraphy, the Arab calligraphy. So she saw her bags on the Queen Rania and so on. Uh, what really makes me happy and gives me this thrill is that every Christmas she writes a, a, a card for me. And because she's a, she's a graduate in literature, in Arabic literature, she writes it very well. And she says how important it is for her uh, to have met Sarah's bag and to have been able to reintegrate into society so easily and to be so empowered and that she has her own career now. And every, every Christmas I feel I made wow. it. That's amazing. Katerina, Yad, Sulafi. Where, where do you, ha, do you, have you had that moment or are you? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> it will come. <laughs> Not yet, no. I don't think I made it, no. I mean, the fact that the, the hearts are sold, it's nice, it's beautiful, we like it. We, we, we're growing, we're growing organically and we're growing fast, but no, I didn't make it. I think I will, that moment will come when at least I will have 100 girls. 100 girls, and, and hun you're with, how, ma how many girls do you Ten. have now? Okay. So it's a long way to go. Yeah. 100 girls is about 150 kids. Wow. 150 kids that could go to university, that could pay for education, that could be proud of their mom, even if dad is no longer around. Yeah. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> neither, neither of you, I want to shift a little bit more to the creative side of your businesses. Neither of you have been schooled in design. Um, how did you, or schooled in fashion even, how did you learn this business? It's not an easy business to be in. <laughs> I learned everything as I went. Like I learned marketing, I learned social media, I learned uh, to design, I learned all types of embroidery. I learned everything as it was, a like Sarah's bag was a school for me. Do you want to and and, and um, did you have some, some sort of moments of failure? You said, how am I going to sort of yes, move on Yes, a lot. This Maybe they're not, uh, no, I don't speak about them a lot, but like going to Paris for the first time and setting, like being present in a trade show, uh, I, I just didn't know what to do. I took all my collection and had it on display and I, um, I waited and nobody came and I only had clients that I already knew placed orders. Like I had, had three orders and they were all from the Arab world, from people I already work with. And this is when I realized it has to be done in a different way. So I, I went back, learned the lesson, yeah. and w went back also to Paris with a collection that is more specific and uh, special for the international markets. Yeah. So every, uh, every time it's, it's not failure, it's more like learning, yeah. learning something new, and uh, you need to keep up. And, yeah. and because it's, um, the model is quite new as a business, so I didn't have a lot of references to um, fall on, f like to look at yeah. and to be inspired from. Yeah, yeah, you were long before brands like Tom's, which have really made this yeah, entire sector quite. I was well there known. when they started coming to when the AUB once came to me and asked me to talk in the CSR uh, conference. I was like. What's CSR? What's CSR yeah. And then you, they say, you, you made CSR, like you're making CSR. I started, like this whole thing taught me everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about for you, Katrina? Did you? On, on the go. <laughs> just on the go. As you've done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I started in my bedroom and I only had one heart. And you design each piece though, have yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. It's me designing everything right now. And uh, yeah, it's on the go. It's on I, there's a certain moment where you think about a project, you think it again, and then how it could be, what it could be, what you could do. But then there's a moment when you have to jump, yeah. you know, and you jump. You just so need I to leave. I, I started in my bedroom, as I said, so <laughs> that, that's all right. And then the design part, 
I, I remember the first the first trade show too. It's uh, it's terrible. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just awful. You're there, you feel totally naked. But if somebody's coming to respect you, say like, mm, I'll buy you. Uh, maybe not. Next time. Yeah. I come in two seasons to see how you are developing. What do you mean in two seasons? <laughs> I'm yeah. there now. Yeah. So it's, uh, but you have to be very receptive to what the market tells you. Yeah. Did you have uh, friends in the industry or anyone you could look to for mentorship? Mm, I have been very lucky. And uh, uh, there have been women very important to me that with their advices have guided me through, through the process. So we say, you know, we have few references. Yes, world. it's always good to ask for help because sometimes you don't realize if you ask for help, you're going to get help. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what basically happened to me. I've always went around and asked in this situation what should be done and this is how you manage to learn. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was designing many more things before the heart and then I met, uh, I still remember for coffee, uh, we were in Amsterdam and I met um, a woman that became one of my best friends uh, and she happened to be the creative director of Karl Lagerfeld. Well, right. Uh, and then she looked at, at the things I was doing. It was like, uh, nah, cute. Just do the heart. Mm -hmm. Forget everything. Throw away all everything else they're doing. Just do the heart. Uh, that's a strong piece. Believe in that. And from that moment on, it just everything started from the heart. And you've done a, col a collaboration with Karl Lagerfeld. And then they asked me for a collaboration for Karl Lagerfeld mm -hmm. because, you know, in Europe there are many skills that uh, in the Middle East are uh, sort of normal or they still exist, while in Europe we don't have them anymore. Mm -hmm. And the micro crochet, I was running a project in um, Turkey for women uh, victim of violence and all of them to relax were doing the micro crochet. And it's an ancient technique. And when the re people from Calagrafa saw the things that I was doing, they fell in love with the technique. Yeah. And they and we started a capsule collection of six pieces that was sold in all the shops of Calagrafa. Wow. Will you will you move beyond hearts maybe and, and things like micro crochet? Would you introduce that more? I mean, what's your expansion plans now? That that's a direction. That's a direction because uh, to become a um, my main goal is to employ women and as many as possible, mm -hmm. right? By doing beautiful things. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of having bags or having other, uh, adding more uh, styles would give me the possibility to employ women with different skills mm -hmm. and always making beautiful products. Yeah. How about you, Sara? Have you thought about doing other things besides bags? And I know you also do other accessories, but ready yeah. to wear, is there any sort of... I'd like to collaborate on ready to wear because it's not my forte. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've all, I always, like I always, uh, I want to create things that are nice and I'd love to create jewelry and I'd love to create even uh, beach wear and so stuff like this. Do you um, do you see that happening soon? Like, should designers here no, take note <laughs> and meet you and say we could <laughs> potentially collaborate? Yes, yes, it's happening. Yeah. It's happening soon. Like in my shop in Be in the boutique in Beirut, you always find different stuff. It's not only bags, not but what we yeah. market around the world is bags. Yeah. Where do your design ideas come from? You always come up with such. You know, I'm, I I have one of my favorite yeah. bags that I carry everywhere in the world with me is a collaboration you did yeah. for Dubai, I think, yeah, with yeah. sauce. Um, but where do these ideas come from? And Everywhere. Like, uh, I think in terms of bags, so everything could be inspiring for me. And when you execute, um, yeah. I, I think you told me an interesting story once a while ago about sourcing elements for, like, for instance, for this bag. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit more about that and where that is? Like, this, uh, like all these small uh, cars were sourced from uh, old uh, like co car collections. And uh, I've actually worked with cars because I have two sons and for a while I was surrounded by small cars and so on. Uh, every collection is, like I look for inspiration everywhere. And first when I st first started, it was always something inspired from the Middle East and our culture with Arabic calligraphy and uh, like uh, Arabesque tiles and so on. And then when we started to uh, reach out for different markets, things had to change, so this is something everybody has to be aware of to be able to adapt to markets you're going to sell in. Like for example, when I, well I go to Paris and show there, uh, I, I have a lot of uh, like cartoonish, quirky stuff that could fit the Japanese market because the Japanese love what uh, 
pop what, art. Yeah, the pop that? art things, yeah. So it's very important to be adaptable to the market, and uh, this is why I have so many ideas. I need to think in terms of markets. Yeah. And when I come to, for example, when I'm here at Fashion Forward, I have a small collection that was designed specially for Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I do the same whenever I go in every market. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to do this because uh, I work in Lebanon. Everybody, uh, like all my workshop and forces are in Lebanon. So I'm very close to the whole team in terms of design and production. This allows me to be very uh, uh, creative. How large is your team now, Sarah? I have 15 people working in the offices mm -hmm. and 200 women working handwork and around uh, 20 men that turns the handwork that turn handwork into handbags. Okay. Like seven different uh, ateliers. Okay. Wow. That's a big operation. Yeah. Um, we're, we're almost out of time. I have one last question and then I'll open it to the audience. Um, and that's on financing. You know, this is a challenge. It's not an, a sustainable or ethical question necessarily. But how, how do you handle the financing end of, of keeping your business growing and, and sustaining it? Um, and where did you start from and, and where are you at now? I'll, I'll start with you, Katerina, on this. Um, I didn't have any support, financial support from everybody. So I was earning a good salary for a long time, and I decided to to put it everything into in, into the brand, into what I'm doing. But it's organic. It's you know, it's about fail and trial, try and fail. It's like you see and you grow. I mean, could have been a fail attempt. Maybe I mean, if nobody was buying the heart, you know, I, I would be back to the European Commission. But yeah. the thing is that um, you have to be very careful with the cash flow, of course. And uh, but whenever you start and you build it up step by step, you may end up with a viable financial uh, uh, business mm -hmm. that doesn't have debts. Mm -hmm. For, you, Sarah. Uh, for me, I started really small and uh, with a little bit of money. And the first few bags I produced I were always bags that people would order, so you'd have to pay up front. This is what, how it was all financed. But there's something very important is that I started locally, and I had the whole, like in Lebanon, with the whole, uh, with, uh, with clients from Lebanon. And then I started to reach out regionally. For nine years, I was only sold in Beirut, and, and I would do pop-ups in different countries, mm -hmm. in different countries around the Arab region, in Kuwait or in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi. This was very important to me to grow this way. Mm -hmm. It's only after nine years that I decided to really go international. So some of the designers would really love to reach out internationally very quickly, and I completely think it's, uh, it's hard to do this because um, if you need to be strong in your own country, and like yesterday, they were talking, they were saying in a talk, you need to be strong in your own country, and you need to have your own audience, and then you need to move up to regional, and then maybe international. But um, being strong in your own country is also uh, is a good source of income and source of support. Yeah, yeah. Well, I am not strong at all in my own country. I st totally. <laughs> well, I suppose the question <laughs> is, what do you consider? But yeah. you don't live in one country, but right? No, You're I live. I live in Holland, okay. and it's where I sell the least the number of hearts. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Well, you live in Holland. You produce in Tunisia, um, yeah. and, and now some in Beirut as well. So See, it's also in Beirut. You're more of a global model, I guess. Yeah, but it, it, to me, sta it started with international markets, and basically, you have to go where the market takes you. Yeah. If the local market works, and it allows you to sell enough product to continue yeah. growing, yes. But to me, it did not work at all. Yeah. And so I had to, I started in Italy. Because Maybe I'm because our markets from the region are more based on word, uh, word of mouth and on PR and so on. It's different than... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most, most likely. I mean, but being in Amsterdam is not exactly far from the fashion. Uh, more of design, to be honest. Yeah. But then being in Italy, I felt that my story was and that the product was much better received. Although I sold my first piece to uh, Luisa Via Roma just because I went to a party. Right. That's maybe, that's <laughs> maybe the reason why it started. So I, got, I was invited to a party and I was wearing the heart and the owner of Luisa Via Roma said, what is this? So well, I told the story, I said, yeah, I want to have it. So the market yeah. decided that I would start in Italy because Luisa Via Roma was based in Firenze. Yeah. 
and then I took it from there. And once you have a, a famous retailer having your product in the window, and then, then it they picks it up. Can move from that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience now, so I don't take up too much time before the next show. Um, yeah, here in the in the center. Sorry. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Ahmed Lernizi. I work for Dubai Design Fashion Council. I had a quick question. Um, we're noticing certain trends where governments are intervening to control certain challenges in terms of creating a sustainable economy. So if we look at the modeling industry, um, we're seeing sort of governments intervening to maybe ban you know, certain models of certain size as a way to promote healthy uh, modeling industries. Then we also see something similar with um, certain bans in Europe for groceries where they're not allowed to dispose um, fruits and vegetables. So they have to give them to um, people in need before they rot or before they go bad. So that was sort of a government intervention on something that was done because it's cheaper to deal with it that way than to deal with waste or to deal with people who have anorexia. So I'm just wondering, do you think it's time for governments to intervene to promote or to support um, CSR? And my second question for you is, do you think it should be just a default that brands should be sustainable? Because there are some brands that are operating that do not uh, market the sustainability models that they use. And not just fashion, uh, maybe, uh, you know, hotel industries, and yes, certain brands as well. Uh, they don't you necessarily use it as a marketing because they feel like it should be just part of the organic framework. However, uh, understanding that it's still a very uh, young, uh, you know, a young understanding. We've only been approaching CSR for maybe 15 years now very seriously. So I just wanted to get your feedback on those two points. <laughs> so uh, it's a long question. <laughs> Uh, should we should we start with the second question then? Should should more brands be um, be using these models oh and they not will. necessarily talking about they it? They will. Yeah. They will. They will have to. And it's not the brand that we have to convince. It's not the government intervention. It's the consumer. Because mm. every time you buy a piece of clothes, you cast a vote. It's as simple right. as that. Right. You know, 20 years ago, uh, the bio market was what? What was the how many bio product would you find 20 years ago? Now, is there any supermarket that they can afford not to have a bio line? You can't. But that doesn't mean that the rest, that the chicken that is bio is okay and the chicken that is not bio has dioxin. You know, that's what the brand has to understand. Mm -hmm. Having a fair trade line or a socially sustainable line doesn't mean that the rest is done using child labor. Right. So, you know, it's gonna be there. Yeah. And the one that will make it go there is not the government, are the consumers. Yeah. It's you. Uh, I think we can take one more question here. Can I ask a question real quick before I oh, pass sorry, on the mic? Oh, sorry, no problem. Um, first of all, thank you both for the work that you do. It's incredible. And thank you guys for shedding light on this topic. It's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, my name is Shahid Shail, and I run an organization called Project Just. And our whole mission is to connect shoppers with the stories behind their clothing. Um, so we tell them the ethics, the standards, the sustainability of the brands that they currently shop from, but also connect them to awesome alternatives um, that they could be shopping from. Um, I'm based here in Dubai, and I'm from Saudi Arabia. Most of the users on our site are from uh, the US and the UK and Japan. Um, and I'm just curious to hear from your perspective, sort of what would it take for shoppers in this region? What type of education and awareness? I mean, obviously shedding light from your perspective as brands, but what other things do you think would work in terms of getting the shopper here to be more aware of these issues? And at the same time, have you sh seen a shift? Um, I know Sarah, you've been operating for a while now. Has you se have you seen a shift in the shopper behavior um, in terms of these issues and what they care about? Thank you. Actually, the Actually, the, I think that people more and more want to buy products that are sustainable and want to know the stories behind the products. There, I haven't, like from when I started, it was, everybody was always very 
uh, supportive of the story. It's, it's not that, but now you feel that the whole world is opening up to these kinds of uh, initiatives, and this is why I got the business, the Oslo for Business for Peace Award. It's because they're trying to shed lights on uh, on uh, businesses that are operating in a way where they um, benefit the society. I think more and more it's by doing talks like these, by uh, being present everywhere, by talking about it, more people are going to be more sensitive to it. But it's up to the consumer, as she said. Uh, there was a, do you know uh, about the fashion revolution? Right, right. So uh, they made a very beautiful experiment in Berlin, uh, I think last year, last year. They had a, um, a box with a video, and there was a T-shirt. You could buy the T-shirt for two euros. Do you know about the story? You could buy the T-shirt for two euros, but before buying the T-shirt, which was very beautiful, for two euros, you had to watch the video, how the T-shirt was made, and then decide to buy it. And the T-shirt was showing, and the video was just showing that the T-shirt was done in shabby places, in awful working condition, by people underage. Would you still buy that shirt? Now, how can you now tell that you don't know? And but again, it's easy to shoot on fast fashion. It's like shooting on the Red Cross, H uh, and M, Zara, whatever. Let's talk about Armani. Let's talk about Prada. Could they please tell us who made that bag and why do we have to pay three thousand euro as long as we know that the person that made it is also paid the fair salary? Why don't we start to talk with them? Why don't you start to talk with them? Say, sorry, who made my 3,000 euro Chanel matelassé bag? The 255 that every woman wants to have? <laughs> I think we can take one more question. Hi, I'm Shruti from an ethical magazine called Address She. My, I have two questions. So the first is, uh, how do you ensure that uh, the women you're working with are committed and accountable for the KREs, I mean, for their work? Because we, we've done a small project and it was really difficult to ensure that they deliver product on time. So how, how do you do that? And uh, uh, how challenging is the training part of it? Because I, I'm sure a lot, lot of women wouldn't know how to do the kind of work you're getting them done. So how do you train them? And the second question is, uh, I, I'm a little more curious about, uh, obviously you're doing a um, ethical uh, fashion brand, but what aspect of ethical lifestyle do you also follow in your personal uh, lifestyle? Like, how, how do you ensure that you know it's 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 a complete 100 uh, 360 degree ethical lifestyle? I think we might only be able to answer the first question yes, if that's okay. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. only for time reasons. Um, but Sara, do you want to address that? Like one of our first challenges was to train the girls, and meeting deadlines was was really something very hard to uh, to work with, especially that they were traumatized and so on. This is. How, why we developed the, um, the work to work also with the women who finished their businesses and to have these women train other women in their villages. So by do, doing so, the girls we are working with in the villages would be able to, uh, to deliver the orders on time and not have to face uh, uh, like uh, not delivering on time like what happens in the prison. And to everything that is produced in the prison is usually sold in my boutique, so it doesn't have a certain time uh, for it. And everything that has to be produced internationally, most of the things that have to be produced internationally, are done by the other girls who are in the villages. We came up with this model because we faced so much, uh, it was so hard for us to train them. Well, I had to go, uh, I think that the process for going from charity to uh, fair trade business is a switch you have to do also in the mind of the people that are working for you. Mm. Because yeah. having worked so many years in development aid, the result of charity of development aid is to create beggars. Yeah. That by the fact that they are poor women and they uh, need help, by the way, I'm not coming tomorrow and I don't even call you. Mm -hmm. No, because we all know as a working women that if you don't show up for two days in a row, you don't even call, you are fired. Right? right? So the same, st if we want to get the fair trade movement or the social responsible movement or ethical fashion, whatever you want to call it, up to the standard, it has to be up to the standard also professional wise. They have to know that they're working with a company. It's not like just charity. And this is what we always repeat and say constantly, that. Constantly, yeah. constantly. I mean, I, I have to fire you if you continue on like that. And we did fire 
some of them. We had to. Yeah. I mean, you are for-profit companies. You are yes. not charities. It's a choice. Yeah. So definition, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Charity is not sustainable. Yes. Absolutely. I think those are great last words. I'm sorry we're not able to take any more questions, but I think our wonderful speakers will probably be around so you can grab them. Thank, Thank you all for being here.